Oh, hello. Dave Burton. Admit. Hey, everyone. I'm just going to give it a second as we have a few more people joining and they're connecting. I'm Brenda. Beamer Chapman. I'm the Director for Social Studies and Personal Financial Literacy at the State Department of Education. And I'm going to be your welcome committee. So if you would, in the chat, give us your name, where you teach. And since it's geography, let's pretend we could travel. If you could travel, where would you be besides here at less than 20 degrees, we decided. <laughs> So your name, where you teach, and if you could travel, where would you like to be today? Somewhere other than my office. <laughs> I guarantee you. Somewhere warm is where I'd like to be. Warmer. <clears throat> okay, I think I've got everybody joining. So once again, I'm Bert Beamer Chapman, Director of Social Studies here at the State Department of Education. And if you would introduce yourself in the chat and tell us who you are and where you teach, and if you could be somewhere else today, you could travel safely, where would you like to go? I'm okay for anywhere warm. Oh, Australia sounds good. Summer. Ireland. Ooh, winter, but not a cold winter. <laughs> I could stop in and meet cousins. I have some cousins in the center of Ireland and uh, uh, on a farm, and they they burn peat in the uh, as part of their heating system. So, wee peat fire smells good, keeps you warm. Ireland. It looks great. like everyone's connected, and I'll kind of keep a watch on the waiting room, Becca. But I'm going to introduce Becca Castleberry from Oak Cage and let her kind of introduce herself and our speaker. Yeah, uh, thank you. Uh, thank you so much to everyone for joining us this afternoon. Uh, we hope everyone is staying warm this week. Uh, my name is Becca Castleberry, and I'm the director of the Oklahoma Alliance for Geographic Education. Today, we have Dr. Steve Stadler joining us, who serves as the state geography steward for Oklahoma. Steve is also currently a professor in the Department of Geography at Oklahoma State University, where he has extensively researched applied climatology and wind power. Today, Steve is going to be discussing Oklahoma's varied geography and how this relates to the state's energy portfolio. Uh, please be sure to stay tuned for a few minutes after the session. After Steve's presentation, I'll go over the information about the PD certificates and we'll do the door prize drawing. Instead of the Nystrom desk atlases, we're doing a drawing for a copy of the historical atlas of Oklahoma. Mm. Thank you, Brenda, for hosting this opportunity and to Steve for being with us today. And Steve, I'll turn it over to you just as soon as you're ready. I think I'm ready. Okay. I think I want to be somewhere else warm. So, uh, and welcome to you all who, gosh, you guys are in the trenches. And I admire you for that. Uh, and uh, I have a daughter-in-law that teaches uh, a science in, in Jenks at the Jenks High School. And she asked me what I do for a living. I can't really explain it to her that I'm not in class as many times as as her and things like that but you guys really rock you, you I mean I can't express myself enough of how much you work and work for the kids and that's what we want to do here with the uh, uh, geography in this talk we want to work work for the kids a little bit so this is going to be exploring geography of Oklahoma with the state geography steward uh, I know him very well it turns out uh, that's me I'm Steve and anytime you, uh, uh, anytime you uh, have a question during this silly thing, well, it's not silly, uh, but 
my silliness, uh, please, uh, please ask. You can ask right as we're going along or save your questions till the end. We'll try to get you out of here on time. My PhD is in physical geography from uh, Indiana State University back in the dark ages. I have been an Oklahoman since 1980. So I'm used to being here. And yes, I've looked at the legislature for a few years and I've traveled around Oklahoma. And I think my family and I have really enjoyed living in Oklahoma. It's a great place to live and, uh, and like that. So uh, we're happy we're here. So I've been working at Oklahoma State University since 1980 and uh, it's, a, it's been a real interesting time. It's always an interesting time. Anyhow, I am a physical geographer by, by degree, but I do applied climatology, which is, uh, is relating, relating the atmosphere to people, I guess. And then for the last couple decades, been working on wind power in Oklahoma. And we had close, close ties with... Uh, 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 with uh, Dr. Scott Green, who's head of the geography department, geography and environmental sciences or whatever that is uh, down there. Uh, he's been my partner in crime for a very long time on wind power. And um, Oklahoma is a windy place and it, it's, it's, uh, it's sort of great that we're using it now, but I had never intended to be uh, a researcher in wind power when I got to the state. That was just, that's came on. We started researching this stuff, and then lo and behold, there's a there's an industry now. I have a lot of ties with OU, like I said, with Dr. Green, uh, for instance, with the with uh, with the wind power, but also uh, uh, setting up, helping to set up the Oklahoma Mesa Network, which you may see on used on TV every night. All those places, you know, uh, it it's, it 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 shows us how varied our geography is, really, and then. Uh, I've interacted quite, I think, quite a bit with, with the, uh, the Geographic Alliance here. I've been the president in the past, and I'm, I'm just, you know, just so happy to help out when I can. Well, what's a geography steward? Well, you're looking at them, you know. <laughs> uh, you're looking at them. Uh, I, am the, uh, uh, I am your geography steward if you live in Oklahoma. And... The National Geographic Society's Geographic Education Division started this in 2017. They've really uh, split off their education efforts from their, uh, their for-profit efforts and tried to do some, some very good things. And the whole, the whole business here is to improve the K through 12 geography. And I don't know what you've read in terms of uh, in terms of studies that have looked at what we as uh, uh, U.S. people don't know about geography, but by gosh, it's really sort of uh, sort of sad when you go and travel in Europe and you talk with the people in Europe. They know uh, some U.S. geography sometimes much better than we do, and 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 it is just so sad that we have a lot of times put geography by the wayside, okay? We put it by the wayside uh, because we've gone on other things which we think are more important and I'm not sure it is because a sense of place is, is very important. People to connect with where they are but also people to appreciate other places because we do live in an interconnected world. So I'm an academic geographer, there is such a thing and what we do is we'll work with National Geographic staff. I have a, uh, I call her our wrangler. <laughs> and and she's, uh, she does a number of states and we interact with her and she interacts with the, with the head honchos at National Geographic. We have a National Geographic Explorers that we do some things with. Uh, if you know the, the, the Geographic Explorers program, which is really exciting uh, for the kids to get uh, get hooked up with and see those explorers work. And then a number of others, such as are appropriate to uh, uh, push geography forward. And some of those others, of course, are the teachers, because we know that to get into the, 
into the into the next generation of 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 our society and and geography we have to do something about educating the educators and i know that brenda feels strongly about this and becca and, and i that one of our problems is that most of the people that do any geography in the Oklahoma schools have really been trained as, as, as history majors. There's nothing wrong with that. Believe me, I had a lot of history hours when I was an undergraduate. But geography is a bit different than history. And geography fills out a lot of things that are uh, uh, just important. I'm, I'm, I'm reading a book about MacArthur and, uh, uh, and Harry Truman. And this book is very well written. It doesn't have a map in it showing you where the 38th parallel is or anything else going on in the Korean sector. Uh, it's, it's, uh, it could really benefit from some knowledge of geography. So it really enriches things in the social studies, I think, if we know some geography. So I'm fairly dedicated along those lines. Well, so I'm supposed to better prepare educators and students to become geographically competent. And we're so incompetent as a group, as Americans. And again, it's not because, as I tell my students, it's not because they're stupid. It's just that they haven't been exposed to it in school and allowed to think about it. So we, uh, we want people to think about things. Uh, I'm not a legislative lobbyist. If I see my, uh, if I see my representative in the hall in, 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 the, uh, in the Capitol building, I'll pull that person aside and I'll, I'll say what I want on my own dime. But I, my, my, uh, my business here as a geography steward is not to lobby the legislature, just so you understand that. And we're, we're not uh, into that. Okay, well, state standards are hidden in this talk here, there and everywhere. And here are some social study standards from Oklahoma. Uh, if you've ever seen, uh, let's see, there are geography standards as well, we won't bring in here. Uh, and so there are a number of geography standards this actually hits. But one thing we want to do in Oklahoma is these are these are just great summaries, I guess, of what we want to do. And we have to make as, as teachers, we have to try to make these things come true. That's the hard part. Student will compare common physical and human characteristics of regions which create identity or uniqueness and influence people's perceptions of the Western Hemisphere. Well, Oklahoma's the Western Hemisphere, and it's certainly a fairly unique in various places. I mean, really, really different. And so that's one thing you're going to see in my little talk here in Oklahoma. Uh, then uh, visual information and apply the mental ma mapping, uh, mapping of political and physical features, people's places, et cetera, et cetera. And I will have a little visual quiz for you just in a moment or two. So uh, we'll, we'll, we'll have that. We'll, we'll show you some pictures. And I firmly believe in integrating uh, uh, pictures because people do not have uh, an image, a mental image about places. And even people that live in Oklahoma do not have uh, full uh, images of what Oklahoma is. And if you ask people from outside, and I, with my wife, have gone various places, and then we're from Oklahoma. Oh, yeah, a lot of wind, right? Yes, there is. And a lot of tornadoes, right? Yes. And it's flat, right? No, no. And, and there's a lot of things that are uh, uh, miscon misconceived, even within the state. Okay. Visual information, draw conclusions, make predictions. I can't do that all in an hour. Uh, from geographic data, analyze spatial distributions. In other words, things that you can map out. And uh, on geographic tools, what this means is we do things with a lot of computer mapping now and laying data layers one on another. And um, again, I'm not going to do that in this talk, but materials that you can uh, receive as teachers from Oak Age and National Geographic for free do have this kind of stuff in it. it it's, it's Again, it's sort of deeper than what I can do in, in this hour. Then uh, describe the distribution of major renewable and non-renewable resources of each region. I, I'm going to do a little of this at least. Again, it's wind power, and I'll talk just 
very briefly at the end about the about uh, uh, some other things about other renewable resources besides uh, besides the wind power. And you all know that oil is pretty big in this state, oil and gas, uh, but uh, decreasingly so it turns out in terms of when you start to look at the output of the oil and gas industry. And that's, I guess it's a shame in some ways, but in other ways, it's gonna go along with what happens in the rest on the rest of the earth. Okay, so now, here we go. I start my physical geography classes like this when we have a physical geography course, because my students haven't had much physical geography. A lot of them have had uh, 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 Oklahoma geography for sure, and, and like that, and that's good. Uh, and and they've had world regional anymore, some of them. And we like to bring this right down to Oklahoma for everybody. So here is the quiz. Now, if you don't get 100% of this quiz, you owe me a soda or something. I don't know what you owe me. You don't owe me anything. But, you, but I want you to just, no cheating. Yes or no is the answer to every question. And each time I go through a, 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 a photo, it's the answer is going to be, or the question is, does this photo look like Oklahoma? And the answer is yes or no. That's all you have to do. Yes or no. Here we go. Here we go. Here's number one. We'll spend just a few seconds on each one to look at it. And then we'll move on. Does this look like Oklahoma? Yes or no. And eventually I'll tell you what everything was. Here we go, number two. Does that look like Oklahoma? Now that of course is an aerial photograph of some sort. Yes or no, that's just a simple one, binary. Does that look like Oklahoma? Yes or no? Does that look like Oklahoma? We're going to 10 here, by the way. Does that look like Oklahoma? Does that look like Oklahoma, yes or no? Does that look like Oklahoma? Yes or no? Does that look like Oklahoma? Does that look like Oklahoma? And then finally, does this look like Oklahoma? All right, now, the answer is, well, there's only 10 of them here. I do a few more in class, but um, it's 10 pictures. The first and the last ones are not in Oklahoma. Everything else was in Oklahoma. We have a tremendously diverse state. It's not boring. And I always say to the students, if you, if you think traveling across Oklahoma is boring, you don't know enough about the landscape. So we'll, we'll give you the, the real answers here. The answers are revealed. Okay. The Chinese have a middle class now and they've discovered tourism. And this is a picture I took on the Li River in Southern China. It's of tower karst, which is a, a interesting uh, uh, solutional physical geographic form. It's just, it looks like fairy tales or something like that. Uh, fairy tale, uh, whatever, used to be a plateau. Okay, so Southern China, not in Oklahoma. This is still water from high altitude. I can see where my house is, but I'm not gonna tell you that. You might be angry later and wanna come and get me. This 
uh, I circled uh, uh, a lot of the campus, and there's there's Boone Pickens Stadium there. There we go, and it's uh, uh, it's an interesting piece on the landscape. You can always pick out universities and things when you look from the geographic tool of aerial photography. You can pick out a lot of things. These are the Kayamanchi Mountains in southeastern Oklahoma. That's just, if, when you tell people there, there's some mountains in southeastern Oklahoma, it's hard for them to believe. Now, strictly speaking, there's not over 2,000 feet from base to summit in most places. So it's, it's that's, that's sort of like tall hills. But anyhow, it's very, very pretty and uh, has a unique culture in that part of the state. Wichita Mountains in southwestern Oklahoma, the National Wildlife Refuge, just, just glorious, glorious, glorious to see things. Ah, wind turbines north of Woodward. These were the first ones put into in the state in maybe 2008 or whenever that was, 2003, I guess it was. Then this is all the way off in Cimarron County, our westernmost county. Uh, this is the remains of part of the Cimarron Trail. And uh, somebody uses it for a, to put their vehicles in to go and manage the cows now. But that is that is the Santa Fe Trail. You can trace that across uh, or, uh, uh, the uh, Cimarron Trail cutoff of the Santa Fe. There we go. And you can trace that in aerial photography. That's Tulsa. Good old Tulsa, one of our big cities, one of our two big cities. And uh, it sure looks like Oklahoma to me. The tall grass prairie with its, with its bison herd. And my gosh, we're lucky to have that here. There's very little tall grass prairie in the world left. Uh, it is just, that's a, that, those are sights to see. And then glass mountains in Major County. Oklahoma erosional forms. The top of that used to be, uh, well, all these layers used to be uh, sea bottom with the shallow inland sea. And there's been a lot of erosion since the land rose up out of that inland sea. Uh, and, and so we take our physical geography students on, on field trip there and about uh, every term. And then I gotta be proud of this one. I was in the right place at the right time. This is Hallstatt in Austria. And this has been in, inhabited since um, uh, since Celtic times, BC, where there used to be mining salt up 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 in that mountain, but this is a beautiful, beautiful little town in in Austria. I recommend a visit if you can do that. All right. Purpose of this quiz: Oklahoma's landscape is varied, and and I hope you figured out the first and the last pictures weren't. Uh, uh, or in Oklahoma, those are red herrings. But it's Oklahoma's landscape is varied in a way that most people don't know. And I think it's vital to know some geography to understand what goes on in this state, not only geographically, not only in terms of, well, what is the physical landscape, but also what the people do on the landscape. So here's some physical basics for you. There's our topography, this topographic map, which you may have in your classroom like that. And the, the topography is, is one of, well, it's, it goes uphill to the west. It goes uphill to the west. And so this lowest point in the state is along the Little River uh, as it leaves Oklahoma, which eventually goes into the Red River, 272 feet. And then the highest point is the top of uh, Black Mesa at 4977. That's a long way up. It's quite a way. We're ramped up to the, to the west. And by the way, there's a little river here <clears throat> as we get into southeastern Oklahoma. There's another little river in uh, uh, central Oklahoma. That's how silly we are, you know. But there's a topography. But have you ever seen it visualized this way? There's a three-dimensional map. Uh, that we can make on 3D printers anymore. You can see the height contours there, but it shows you that that old panhandle just ramps up to the west. And, and uh, it's a state where it is hardly, of course it's vertically exaggerated here, but this state is hardly flat over most of its territory. Where do we get it? Where do we get it? Uh, uh, where do we get the moisture come out of the sky? Where does that come from? Well, of course, that's 
that's coming from the Gulf of Mexico most times. This cold Arctic air basically has very little moisture in it. It's only the sort of the tropical side air that brings us much moisture at all. Now, if you look at Oklahoma and where the Gulf of Mexico is, the western part of the Gulf of Mexico, you're going to see a correspondence between that longitude and, ah, please move this, I don't know. Yeah, can that be moved by me? It could be. Okay, thank you. Because I'm not seeing any chat here, so that's okay. Huh, why don't we go backwards? Okay. Anyhow, the precipitation pattern is like that moisture supply. Because the winds come from the west generally, the, uh, the, the moisture from the Gulf of Mexico can't get directly to western Oklahoma. So it's a much, it's a much uh, lesser uh, precipitation amount. Highest precipitation amounts are, uh, are in the southeastern Oklahoma, uh, influenced by the presence of those mountains. And uh, some places have over 50 inches a year of precipitation. Other places here, as we get to Black Mesa, uh, closer to 15 inches a year. A very great disparity in precipitation. Now, if we can go down, hello. It's not moving. There we go. It is moving. Here we go. Now, we, uh, we, Put this, or think about that pattern of precipitation, yeah, yikes, along with the greenness of Oklahoma. Now, this is a satellite image of greenness. This was like in July, okay, in July. And the places that are close to being as green as green could be, which would be a, a well-watered, probably uh, alfalfa field or something like that, uh, and, and the greenest stuff here doesn't have to be alfalfa. They're portrayed in the darker green. The places that are less green are in the uh, yellows and orange. And what we see is the panhandle is less green, except for places that have some green that are irrigated and uh, from, uh, from groundwater. And then a lot of the state uh, in the sort of west central part of the state is not very green that time of year because they've taken off the green winter wheat crop. It has matured, been taken off, and what you're looking at is fairly bare soil. And then as we go to the east, there is more greenness. It's not totally green, but this is really where the forests of the eastern United States start or end because there's more precipitation. We use the land for sure, and this land is uh, used in, in quite a bit different ways in, in Oklahoma. So we see this, uh, this, the greenest stuff here is not greenness, but this is talking about the cultivation of the land, the human use of the land. And those greener places have, uh, the greenest has over 75% of the land cultivated. So that big winter wheat belt is there. And uh, let's see, the cotton area in the Southwest shows up too. And then the irrigated lands in, in the panhandle. In the, wet, in the east, there is still cultivation, but it is not as, as prevalent. A lot of this in the east is used for range and pasture land. And those trees make a difference. And of course, we have the rangelands out west of the winter wheat belt. Okay, now. Excuse me, the people on the landscape, and I'm going to just take a little sip. People on the landscape, they use the landscape. They use available resources here and over the rest of the world. So in eastern Oklahoma, in the old timey days, in the days of the, uh, of, of the Native American resettlement, and then eventually the, the Europeans came in, you saw a lot of log cabins being built. Well, log cabins need wood. Okay, they need wood. And there you see it. This is in, uh, that, that cabin I think is in Shawnee. But if you go west of where the trees are in Oklahoma, this is the kind of stuff 
you got it first, at least, when there was no good transportation to bring in uh, uh, lumber from other places. Here's good old sod house. And uh, you take a look at took, take a look at the wood that's in there. Yeah, there's some wood in there, but I think they went went down near the creek and found some uh, uh, found some uh, small small pieces of trees down there. So they were using sod because that was available and uh, perfectly good unless you had to live in it. I think uh, stories of insects and things like that. But they used the resources. Now. People, what they do with the resources is certainly constrained by what resources are where. We're constrained by the land. So here's the beautiful cross timbers. The cross timbers are, it's actually a fairly large area in Oklahoma and Texas. And they call it the cross timbers because it's sort of oriented north south. And if you want to, in the old days, travel east west across that, it became really, really tough because the trees were pretty close together. And these are scrubby trees. There you go. These post oaks and other other things. The understory is is really brambly, poison ivy. It's just sort of hideous to go through until you have a little bit of uh, a, a load a clearing and a, a road clearing and all this kind of stuff. And when Washington Irving came and and he spent some time here in Payne County and camped out, but. Uh, he called the cross timbers the the forest of, of, of cast iron because it was just it was, they were terrible uh, and you know you try to cut down a tree to get firewood and they're like it's like cast iron they're very 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 hard little oak trees so uh, so we didn't have a lot of use of these cross timbers they were too small to make beams for houses out of. it was just difficult or railroad ties. So there's a lot of cross timbers actually still left. There's some there's some uh, cross timber trees just uh, right bordering Keystone Lake. Nature Conservancy has the land. Those those trees are 300 years old. They're still there. There's the cross timbers. Now let me let me do something for you here. There the, there's the cross timbers map. Now you can't think of all everything in that yellow as being solidly wooded even before there were many people here, but it was, it was considerable, okay? And you've heard about the Chisholm Trail. The Chisholm Trail took cattle from Southern Texas and to the railheads uh, in um, uh, Kansas so that the ca cattle could be shipped to market further east. It was uh, some way to make money in Texas. Well, to get over Oklahoma, the Chisholm Trail certainly was mainly to the west of these cross timbers. Sometimes uh, the cross timbers, the edge of the cross timbers there have been called the meridian of the plains because it was easy to move the cattle out here, but not along through those cross timbers. So that was well known at, at first. And of course, you know, the railroads came in and that ended all the problem with the Chisholm Trail or anything like it. But it's part of our history where we were constrained by the land. Today, about three quarters of our population live east of Interstate 35. There is a population map. They don't have the 2020 population map out yet, but that's by census track in uh, Oklahoma and the population density you see. But about three quarters of us live east of I-35. There's a lot of open land to the west of Inter. Uh, Interstate 35, and, and and therefore, uh, lots of things, if you're going to exploit resources, it really, you get in less people's way further west than further east. So there's 3.9 million of us now. Yay. Okay, now, wind and geography will bring these two together. As far as I'm concerned, wind and geography are, uh, uh, have physical and cultural features or factors interwoven. They go together. Uh, even you say, hey, I want to put up a, a wind turbine or something like that. You better have the physical resource to do it. And you also must, must have uh, you must have a way to get the electricity to where it has to go. You have to have a way to uh, uh, to uh, procure, procure enough land for a wind farm. And there's all sorts of things going together. So now some science. My way. Okay. You've all heard of Watts. 
and I got to remind myself uh, and my wife, I think, who was listening, maybe uh, that uh, we got to put in that uh, uh, light that popped out over the the back door the other night. Uh, and if we're measuring what's going through that that bulb, we do it in watts. It may be 60 watts or something like that out there. You're all familiar with watts. And at your houses, you pay uh, you pay the piper if you're on the grid. Uh, you're, you're paying in kilowatt hours. So a watt is an instantaneous amount of energy going by. And over what amount of time does that go by? We usually do that for houses in kilowatt hours. But now let's go to wind power. In wind power, we go beyond kilowatts. We could go kilowatts if we're going to do, if we're going to have a wind turbine for one home. That's pretty, you know, that's that's pretty neat, but it's it's much more expensive per kilowatt hour than something much bigger. And that's why we do things big, big, big in, in wind power. So we have megawatts, which are millions of watts, and then gigawatts, when, which are trillions of watts. And when we start talking about the world energy supply, we're in gigawatts. If we talk about the uh, uh, energies uh, coming off of Oklahoma turbines, we're talking about megawatts. Why is this going on? Well, you know what? It has to do with technology and the tre technology has driven the cost and then there's good capitalism. So this graph is of the levelized cost of energy from uh, well, let's see, uh, from a decade or more ago. And this is what wind, uh, wind power costs in megawatt hours in the dotted lines. And just in that time, there's been a 70% decrease. So that when you talk about levelized cost of energy, ELCO, what it means is that you're comparing the energy cost of, of the various sources of energy and you're comparing them on a uh, apples to apples basis. You're getting around the idea of, well, what in any kind of way does the government subsidize, any kind of government subsidies uh, are happening. And really in, for Oklahoma, our Oklahoma government does not subsidize wind power at all anymore. Now, so it's come down, the economics have become very, very favorable and you're, you're getting these big wind farms that are going, going on that are uh, per, per megawatt hour are cheaper to run than coal-fired power plants. And this is why you see coal-fired power plants winking out along the, uh, around the country. And uh, wind power has certainly gotten competitive with natural gas. Natural gas hasn't been very high, of course, and it's still uh, wind power is still competitive. But the thing about wind power, unlike some other energy sources that you'll see go by here, okay, it doesn't release carbon dioxide in the atmosphere. You may not care about that, but it's not a, it's not a, a carbon a polluter. That's one thing. And it doesn't use any water. All these other things drive uh, are driving steam turbines, even nuclear power plants. We don't have any nuclear power plants in Oklahoma, by the way. But even nuclear power uses steam turbines. And you have to have a source of water. And so that becomes very, very important. So on a, on a cost by cost base, per cost basis, wind power stands up really, really very well now in a way that they thought was going to happen. Now, why is this? It's because the technology has changed. Now, if you're going to build your wind farm, I keep telling my wife I want one in the backyard. She said, no, 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 no. You don't have enough backyard. For each wind farm that goes up in this state, there are hundreds of millions of dollars invested. Hundreds of millions. And so it, 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 is, a, it is something that you have to have a lot of capital. It's capital intensive to start the wind farm. And then after that, of course, you have to have some maintenance, but the maintenance is sort of a known quantity and it's, in, and, it's, and it's manageable compared to the upfront costs. But these are massive beasts. So that's, uh, let's see, that's Blue Canyon. 
out there north of Lawton, where they have the, the wind turbines up on high ground. Okay, now this is, this is me and Becca meeting uh, up on top of the turbine. We had, no, it isn't, no, it isn't, no, it isn't. This is where I don't go. I have no desire to build, but this is showing you how big they are. In Oklahoma, these nacelles where the, the guts are, are gonna be maybe 80 meters above the ground. And you're talking about in excess of 250 feet because you have to have very big blades to generate all that electricity. And it takes people to go climb up on the inside and do some maintenance. There's some very, very good paying jobs out there in the Oklahoma economy. So here we go, there's, there's the blades and they're huge. If you might've seen them going down the road, they're absolutely huge. And they're usually put on, on top of a, uh, a metal tower that's really, really has a lot of concrete and rebarb underneath it, very solid foundations. And the towers are usually in three parts. And then is there is the nacelle, and that's the guts of the uh, of the uh, of the turbine, uh, uh, of the generator at least, because the the blades turn around, and 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 the kinetic energy of the wind that's moving the blades are are uh, it's it's uh, transferred to this low speed shaft and a gearbox, and and in some. Some models now we don't have any more gears, which is even more efficient. And that gear, you gear up, and you and you, you're generating a less electricity, right up there in the nacelle. So the the principles are sort of simple. The engineering is absolutely awesome. These uh, wind turbines will turn into the wind, uh, so they're always fairly efficiently trying to trap wind. Also, uh, just like airplane propellers, uh, they uh, are computer pitched to get the best cut into the wind. And should we have a big Oklahoma thunderstorm, big wind, uh, uh, these blades will, will essentially feather out and uh, they don't want the blades wrapping around. Because the blades are made of composite materials, uh, in the simplest form, we could call that fiberglass. It's a little bit higher tech than the fiberglass in our boats, but uh, uh, it is something that can be broken uh, and can be worn down over time, but uh, not to worry. Okay, so there we are. Here's a, a recently installed wind farm. This is out near Kingfisher. I think this is, I think this is Skeleton Creek. And these are big ones. We, we keep getting bigger and bigger and bigger in, in terms of the output of the turbines uh, because it's more and more efficient. It costs less per kilowatt hour per megawatt hour to generate. So uh, there is, these are 2.8 megawatt watts per turbine. And you have many of these turbines spread over the landscape. They look like they're uh, randomly scattered, but well, really not. Uh, and wind farm layout is a bunch of, of WTGs are wind turbine generators. So the greens are where you have the wind turbines. And you're gonna do a couple of things. You're gonna put them on the highest ground so they can reach up and get the best wind because the higher we go up in the sky, the faster the air goes. And there is quite a difference between uh, the near surface air that we experience and 80 or 100 meters up. It makes a big difference in the power output. This goes to, is uh, basically underground, by underground wires and go to, this as collector system station. Well, this is a substation. And then somehow it gets interconnected to what we call the grid. So you have to have very substantial uh, transmission uh, to, to do this. And it is not done by the, uh, the wires running down, uh, electrical wires running down country roads. So here we go. Uh, it's, it's a land use that is certainly in a way sustainable. There are the wind uh, turbines that is out at uh, Weatherford. That's Weatherford. And of course, these are surrounded by winter wheat country. And so most of the land in the wind farm is going to be cropped or grazed. Uh, it, it only takes about a maybe about a half acre total 
when you talk about the pad for the wind turbine and the, the, the little access road that's gonna go to it, 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 about a half acre that's gonna get taken out of production. So there are some nice uh, Oklahoma cows out at uh, Blue Canyon, and they don't care if the, if the turbines are there, they are just gonna graze. And in fact, uh, I've seen them in Oklahoma in the summertime where they, they're just, they're gonna stand in the shade of, of, that, of that tower. So it's not gonna bother your, your farm critters at all. Okay, economically, this has been very good. Oklahoma has really latched on to this. Right now, I think we're, it's either fourth or third, depending on which wind farms come in, but we are still putting up wind farms in Oklahoma, even though there's no uh, help from the Oklahoma government. It's all, it's private enterprise, it's capitalism. So we start out 2003 are the first turbines and, and this is two, 2019, which is the last full year is good data we have and we're, we're zooming. About a third of our, more than a third now, it's probably closer to 40% now after 2020 uh, of our actual electrical generation in Oklahoma is from wind power. I can't express this too much. It's not a fad. It's gonna be here because these turbines will last with what they have in them for 20 or more years, and then they get refitted with, with better equipment. And so it's going on, it's going on, it's going on, it's going on. Uh, where I'm sitting here in my beautiful office, uh, it is uh, uh, two thirds of the energy uh, that Oklahoma State University uses comes from wind power. Because Oklahoma State University said, hey, we know what the wind power costs now. We know what it's gonna cost for the next 20 years. It's incredible. They don't have to worry about what the spot markets on, on energy are gonna be and things like that. The wind is a, a supply that, that is here. Uh, okay, so we're, the geography, where can wind best be uh, exploited? Uh, well, you want more wind because you'll have more return on investment. You can make money in Eastern Oklahoma with wind turbines with the present technology but not as much as in Western Oklahoma and some parts of North Central Oklahoma because those are the windiest places. And it also happens very conveniently that Oklahoma's windiest places are also the least populated in Western Oklahoma. So you have the least people to deal with when you wanna put up a wind farm. It's still complicated, but there it is. Okay, here's our average annual wind speed at 80 meters. And it's the places in the purple that are most highly coveted for wind power. Again, there are other places like on the, uh, near the uh, Wichita mountains, some places up near uh, north of Ponca City, between Parkland City and Bartlesville are pretty good. But these are the places in the reds and the, um, and, and the purples. Those are the places that have modeled as, as the best. And we did the first uh, uh, modern mo modeling here uh, at OSU and OU uh, before, years before the first wind turbines went in and we were modeling every 30 meters in the state. It had to do with the wind, the wind speeds we got off the meso network. And then it had to do with the up and down on the land. And then it had to do with the land use land cover because more trees on its own means less wind. wind winds are slowed down by the trees. So here are the wind power installations in Oklahoma and those wind power installations and in our friends to the south there. Uh, but here are the wind power installations right now. And again, we're starting to get some in the east, uh, but they're not as, they won't generate as much per dollar put in as they're, you know, uh, just not going to. It's not that they're not economical and that's part of this whole thing. We got a resource and we have to look at the economics. So we're, we're doing, uh, we have a capacity of 1893 megawatts. And you say, well, what? Wait a minute, what, you know, what happens if the wind doesn't blow? Uh-oh, you know, uh, and, and the idea is it is mainly blowing somewhere. And what you don't see here is the bigger picture over the central United States where there's lots of wind power generators. And there are, they are connected with what we call the grid and so that if some place is lacking the wind at some time, it is picked up by other places anymore. At some 
times, what's happened is that the Southwest Power Pool, which is our regional, many states, regional grid administrators, has had more than 50% of its energy coming from wind power. It's here. Then transmission, if you're gonna put up a wind farm, you better have some transmission. You better have uh, some transmission nearby. Either you have to put it up or a power company has to put it up. That's expensive, that's complicated. And so uh, here are uh, the 345 kilovolts, if you know what those are, transmission lines in, in our state currently. And this is the, the grid. And after you have the resource, the grid is the key. You have to be able to ship it somewhere. Now this looks like we're really well connected with uh, Texas that's in another uh, power pool and we're not. It's like, it's like maybe the, like, like maybe it's sort of like having with the amount of resource we have, it's, it's, it's like having an extension cord going across the Red River. Now that's another problem. There's another social problem is that the states and the, in the, in the power grid, uh, 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 not owners, but the power grid uh, administration don't exactly all do the same thing. And in fact, in the United States, the grid is not one grid, it's all cobbled together. We're getting more and more transmission lines because we've had more and more wind power going in. And this stuff can be shipped a long way. Uh, Texas essentially killed our, uh, not our idea, but the idea of, and well along in having a, a transmission line go from out here in Northwestern Oklahoma all the way to Memphis. And that would have been direct current in the sort of no on and off ramps, very efficient to, uh, uh, to do our, uh, uh, to, to send the power very, very far. So we can, we can export the power. Okay, in Oklahoma, there's about 9,000 jobs dependent upon wind power. People that are going up into the thing, uh, into the things, people that are helping to uh, uh, manufacture some of the parts. Uh, and wind, wind power is the largest taxpayer in 14 counties because they're paying ad valorem tax. And so are the people who own the land. See, the wind power companies or whatever do not own the land. They lease it. And they are leasing it in Western Oklahoma from farmer ranchers who really like the every year money they get. You know, if you're getting $20,000 a year for taking a half acre out of production, you're, you're pretty favorable about that. And those people that own the land, of course, spend money and are taxed. And so this is a, a, a part of the economy that which Oklahoma did not have 20 years ago. A lot of the uh, ad valorem uh, the fact that there are turbines on the landscape that goes into the schools, and some some, some school districts have become uh, uh, have had a very favorable economic balance because of this. Uh, in in a county like Oklahoma County, where there's a lot of people and there's no wind turbines, this doesn't this doesn't uh, boost the whole county like that. Well, I like this. Uh, I like some art once in a while, and if you've ever seen the Scream, it's a that's a very famous painting, uh, but but this is not this is the fa this is the famous cartoon from it. There are the wind turbines, and there's the scream. Well, as all these things were wrong, birds hit the things, and bats, and the lesser prairie chickens are scared. Well, they found out the lesser prairie chickens aren't so scared, and the lesser prairie chickens are not. Their their numbers have declined, because, but that's because of uh, of the land use into cropland and grazing over time. Birds and bats do hit these things in Western Oklahoma, but it's not of, I think, my judgment is of great significance because they've done count, counts around the turbines and it's just not, uh, they're not taking dense in populations, things like that. Uh, Oklahoma tax sub sub subsidies have been removed because the legislature didn't want it. They said it's too expensive for us. And uh, even though this is putting money into the economy, they're not going to help it along. Okay. Uh, now, the other thing is you have to realize that by tax exemptions, we we subsidize the oil and gas industry fairly heavy. I'm not I'm not against the oil and gas industry, but I'm just saying it's not quite an even playing field. Some people claim their husband's heart condition went down be, uh, because of, they could see the turbines. 
And that's never been shown in any kind of scientific study. Noise, noise is not a problem unless you're really pretty close, with, unless you're within a few hundred meters, because if those turbines are running, you know, they're up a little bit, and uh, the wind noise that you're getting in your ears, flapping in your ears in Western Oklahoma is a, sometimes a lot more than what you're getting off of the turbine. Property values, my property values are gonna go down and a national study by the folks out at uh, 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 labs out, uh, energy labs out in California uh, show that's not the case even in, in Oklahoma. So there's pushback and some people don't like it Okay, so the state legislature actually banned turbine placement from being near all hospitals, schools, and airports. And here's, a, here's some of our a ways of, of visualizing that geographically. So what we did in a geographic information system, we knew where all the schools were and all the hospitals and all the airports. And we, we, we had the machine draw a a, uh, a nautical mile and a half buffer around each one. Now, why the state uses nautical miles, I'm not sure, okay? But there's the places that the turbines cannot be. So they were trying to eliminate, you know, back off the turbines from a lot of things where the, uh, 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 was a legislature, and I'm not quite sure what actual good it's done. Okay, here's the Minko Wind Farm right there, and that's the Canadian River Valley. And remember Interstate 40, when we used to have an interstate before it was all ice, runs along in there somewhere. And you can see those wind, wind turbines. But this is a, a, a geographic information system view of, of, uh, uh, of the situation where you have a digital landscape and then you have what we call a view shed. So the blue places are everywhere from where the turbines can be seen. And they can be seen from quite a distance, you know, 10, uh, 10 miles or more, no problem. And there, there we go. And some people don't like to look them out on the landscape because they, they just don't like the look of them. And that's, that's the, the reason they give. But now let's look at a little bit of oil and gas industry. There's our, some things that are familiar to us all here in Oklahoma, familiar to us all. Uh, and uh, but, yeah, go ahead. Uh, we just have a couple more minutes. Yes. Uh, just um, about a couple of minutes out. Yeah. Here we you go. Yeah. Awesome. Thanks. And uh, that Becca keeps me on time. Anyhow, those are familiar to us. Here's the same uh, view shed, but now there's there's the uh, there's the, the the wind turbines, and the reds are the the reds are the places where there are oil and gas pads visible from aer aerial photography, and. I don't know what the complaints are with the oil and gas industry. Maybe it's just that we've been used to it for so long. There are other renewables out there. Solar is starting to come big time into this state. It's starting to be competitive. Although the Oklahoma laws and what you have to do to hook on to uh, a grid system is, is still a little bit uh, uh, bad. Now let's just put it that way. But the solar is in a place where the wind power probably was 10 or more years ago. It's going to come on because we have lots and lots of solar energy. Hydropower, there's little left to be developed. Okay, we just don't have uh, a lot of falling water in the places in the in, 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 where there's uh, in, in this state, in the western part of the state, there really isn't. Then the biomass stuff, where we burn biomass or convert biomass into gasoline, it really depends on government subsidies at this point. So the other renewables are not nearly as big as wind, but the solar is going to come on. The solar is going to come on. And when we get improved batteries where the wind and, and the solar can be going at some times and then storing energy effectively at other times, that's when we really hit our renewable stride. So key sources of great geography. Uh, are, there's lots of things out there with the National Geographic in their education realm. Go and look through that stuff. There are, there are lots and lots of materials, not just in in resources, but just anything you can think of with National Geographic. And then our Oklahoma Alliance for Geographic Education has a just a number of materials out there on that website uh, that, that can be used in classrooms. So with that, I say, I, I don't have anything more to say, you know? And does anybody have any, uh, I'm gonna stop sharing here. Does anybody have any questions that uh, need to be answered or not need to be answered? 
Yeah, uh, thank you so much, Steve. That was awesome. So uh, while everyone is maybe thinking of a question, I will go ahead and do the door prize drawing while everyone is still here. And that is going to be for the Historical Atlas of Oklahoma. I'll drop that link in the chat box so you guys can take a look at that. Uh, here we go. All right, and the winner of the Historical Atlas is Nino Williams. So Nino, if you could just type in the chat that you're here. And um, I believe you emailed me earlier today, so I've already got your email so I can coordinate with your, um, your shipping address and everything. So Nino, if you're here, just type in the chat that you're here and you'll receive the Atlas. All right, great, great. Um, so did anyone have any questions for Steve before I uh, wrap up today? At least too much too fast is what it huh. is, but I wanna give you an idea that geography counts in a lot of different ways. Wind power is one of them. Yeah, yeah, awesome. All right, well, everyone who is here today is eligible to receive a one hour PD certificate. Ooh, yeah. So. If you would just email me uh, with your first and last name to request your certificate, I will send that to you. And then uh, since we're a little low on time, I'll just drop everything else in the chat that I normally go over with you guys. Let's see. Thanks for listening from me. <laughs> oh no, whoops, I guess it's not. Hmm. So Steve, I guess while I'm doing this, I did have a question. So you had mentioned the cost of wind power and um, that OSU has a certain percentage of their- 66%. Yeah. Okay, their but but wind. you being employed at OU, you have 100%. Yeah, yeah. So my question is related to, um, yeah, I guess, I'm not sure why I can't- We're using cow methane for the rest or something. Yeah, yeah. So Actually, I guess we're question, using coal from OG and E for the rest. Yeah. So my question is, so if if you're say a residential customer and you sign up for the OG and E 100% wind, like what does that actually mean? Because obviously, like it, no one's flipping a switch. They're saying like, oh, now to your house only wind. You don't know where yeah. the electrons are coming from. Yeah. <laughs> okay. You just don't. Now, that's a good point. Yeah. You do not know where they're coming from. But on the mix, the whole power mi grid mix, they're going somewhere, and mm -hmm. so you will you will have some advantage to that. And, okay. And uh, uh, Oklahoma State uh, uh, is basically says, oh, we take two thirds of the energy out of this uh, wind farm near wind farm near Blackwell. So uh, it, it's it's been a good thing. I wish they would revisit it because it certainly hasn't cost them a lot of money. <laughs> it saved the money again. If you and it's for the residential, it is it should help certainly over time. But the state of Oklahoma and the way it's um, our corporation corporation committee, no corporation commission, which regulates this, we're still not all the way up to where some other states are in terms of, in, in terms of what happens and, and like that. So it's still not uh, optimal, I would think. That's my opinion. And uh, we have things to go. And certainly with solar, we're, we're seeing the same sort of thing. There's going to be a lot of solar too. It's just that we, we have these resources that we can use. So uh, I'll leave it there rather than get in more trouble. Yeah. All right. Well, thank you. Um, that's all I've got for you guys. Um, if anyone has any questions for me, or if you think of anything that you'd like to ask Steve later on, uh, just feel free to email me at okjetou.edu and we will get back to you. Um, but yeah, thank you again for being here and uh, I'll stay on just for another minute in, in case anyone has any questions about OKJ, but otherwise uh, have a great evening and try to stay warm. That guy, I see my wife is watching now. Mm -hmm. We can't meet like this. <laughs> Have you met my wife, Barbara? 
Did you meet her at any time? Oh, you should. Mm -mm, never have. Hmm. Well, she's <laughs> she's trying to figure out still what I do for a living. So. Sure. Sure. Ah! Oh, there she oh! is. I see her. Hello. <laughs> Thanks for joining she's us. In my chair. She's in my chair. <laughs> the guy got in my chair. <laughs> so okay. What did you learn, Barbara? Uh-oh. Unmute. <laughs> All right, now I'm unmuted. I oh, okay. that, what did you I've learn, heard Barbara? A lot of that before, so you know, it, there wasn't a lot new, but there there were some things that that were updated from what I had heard before. And the, stati the statistics were interesting too. Oh yeah. Again, it's not a it's not a fad. It's it's a it's it's here. It's happening. It will keep happening. And in Stillwater, we cannot buy into wind power because we're Grand River Dam Authority. They don't have a they don't have a way to do it. So, and they don't have they don't have. I think they may be putting up a little wind power generation somewhere in the Northeast, but very little compared to like oh, G&E has put up a lot in, in PSO, so. Uh, and by the way, I'm the one that wants to put the, the wind turbine in the backyard. <laughs> and he's the one that says, no, we can't. <laughs> well, I asked our neighbor, Terry, and I want to put a Bergie wind generator in there. And I asked my neighbor, Terry, it's, it's okay, but I'm going to have to guy wire it in, into your yard. Is that fine? <laughs> no. So there, there are certain little problems with being in the, in the town and that kind of technology. Uh, yeah. And it, as, a, as a society, I guess, or whatever, as a state, we're better off actually going to the wind turbines, the big wind turbines, and collectively get, because they're so much more efficient than the, these small ones. But there's some great places out there that still the little wind turbines do well on. You take a little solar panel, or, uh, or you uh, you take a little wind turbine. It can be driving a, uh, it can be putting stuff into a battery, and it can open your your ranch gates for you and things like. There's all sorts of little things that can be done with smaller, but not at my house probably. <laughs> Is the electricity still coming in the house, Barb? Yes. Right. <laughs> they, yeah. haven't cut, they haven't cut it off. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> One of my students today, when they taken that test online, said. Well, Oh, I just keep back on, back on, you know. It's, yeah, ooh. I get it. So. All right. Uh, well, um, if you guys don't have anything else for me, I'm going to take uh, off. Steve, hopefully you can get home safely before the roads start getting bad <laughs> again. Uh, the road, well, I don't think they'll get They're any worse than bad. when I came that's, up this morning. Yeah, that's the reason, yeah, that's it's, the reason uh, I was a little bit late is, is I was I was out voting and, uh, again? Went, to the, and went to the grocery you, store. Did you and, fake the vote? <laughs> and they're not too bad. Uh, there were only okay. 90, 99 people, 98 people ahead of me that voted. So this is, it, this it, is a school board not election. not a big turnout. <laughs> what is, no, there's a school board and city commission, and right? city council. A couple, just a couple spots. Yes. Yeah. Uh, it's, it's like, and of course, I was worried about you going out because going to that church, which is something that you go up into that driveway. I mean, it's a. It wasn't bad at all. Okay. Yeah. Bottom yeah. of Lake Ridge Avenue was bad, though. Did you go out the bottom of Lake Ridge? It was all I see. I came back the bottom, which is down at the at the main street. Well, and you can yes, make it, it up. It wasn't any good. It is still. Uh, yeah. The, it's still the, icy. The roads are not going to get any better. I mean, because it's so cold, uh, but they're not going to get any worse until it starts doodling again. So. Yeah. Yeah. You know, I, I, ooh, we'll see what happens if we have school tomorrow. So I have my stuff packed in here so I don't have to come up if I don't have to tomorrow. Mm -hmm. All right. Well, well did I do what you wanted me now? to do, Becca? What? Did it? Did I do what you wanted me to do? Yes, okay. you did. You did a very good job. Oh, thank you. <laughs> and my wife, my wife says, we'll talk when I get home because now she has some other things going on. But yeah, uh, thank you so much. Uh, I thought that was great. Um, and yours, like, uh, normally we don't have as many people so normally it's um well i saw it on my facebook for gosh sake yeah normally it's maybe just uh, you know two or three people why don't we get them why don't we get them uh, why don't you get a tiktok where you're dancing around with a sign and saying come on no okay <laughs> yeah you, yeah 
I well, this is a handy way myself. from some teachers to to get some stuff done. So mm -hmm. all yeah. for it. All right. All right. Well, thank home you so soon, much. Barbara. Okay. <laughs> Becca, Becca's already home, I think. She's home. So. Don't yeah. go to okay. the grocery. <laughs> oh, did you go to the grocery store? Yes. Oh, okay. All right. Thank you. Oh, you picked up some good groceries. It's going to be dinner sometime. Uh oh, somebody wants to be admitted. I, yeah, I, I'm going to leave that for Brenda. Maybe she's got like another oh, thing. Oh, is it her after. same? I'll just leave it. But I'm just, I'm just going to leave the meeting. I'm out of here. Get there and she'll see it. Live long All and right, prosper, friends. All right. Bye. Bye. It's nice, nice to meet you, Barbara. You, Becca. <laughs> Bye.